Good morning, everybody. We're going to give everybody a few moments to tune in and get uh, get all situated here before we begin. Hey, good morning, folks. Starting to see people tune in. Welcome to today's snack chat. We'll get started here in just a moment. Good morning, Marge. Thanks for tuning in. Good morning, Maureen. Paul, if you're there too, good morning. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Tad Yankoski. I'm the senior entomologist here at the Butterfly House. And uh, we're excited to come to you live here on Facebook for today's snack chat. And uh, right now I'm in the insect containment lab here at the Butterfly House. And I am surrounded by thousands of bugs. And today we're going to talk to you all about at least what I think what makes a bug a bug. Depending on who you ask, there could be different answers for that and different definitions for what is a bug. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And I'm going to introduce to you a lot of my friends that are different kinds of bugs. And we'll talk about what makes them special and what makes them different from each other. So you might be wondering why I have this picture of me from before quarantine next to this frog. And because neither of them are bugs, this frog is not a bug as he's trying to roll away. And I'm certainly not a bug here in this photo. But I promise by the end of today's talk, it'll make sense why we started with this. But we'll come back to it later. So when I talk about bugs, I'm usually talking about arthropods. And arthropods are many different things. And they have very similar characteristics, though. They usually have uh, segmented bodies. Uh, arthropod it usually is associated with uh, segmented bodies and, and different body parts. But there's many different things that can be an arthropod. They usually have specialized appendages. Maybe they have heads. Uh, or uh, abdomens and thoraxes, uh, tarantulas are arthropods, jumping spiders, this guy here is a whip scorpion. These are all their molts that you see here. And all arthropods molt. They shed their skin in order to get bigger. And we actually save a lot of our molts, from our, especially from our tarantulas and other arachnids. And we have lots of them. These are all the shed skins of tarantulas and scorpions and related animals. This exoskeleton that they all have on the outside of their body does not grow with them. And so in order for them to grow and get bigger, they have to shed their skin. And you may have remembered in some of our earlier talks, we talked about how a tarantula actually has to have the top of its head pop open like a trap door, and they crawl out of their old exoskeleton. Now, talking about arthropods in general, there are many different kinds. We're going to focus on three main groups today. We're going to talk about uh, myriapods, which is a fancy way of talking about things that have lots of legs. So we're going to talk about uh, mostly millipedes in that group today. Well, then we're going to talk about arachnids, which you see some of their molts here. Most um, people associate arachnids with spiders, but there's a lot more things. 
And then we'll talk about insects, which is really what the butterfly house is mostly known for. So, right here are our mirror pods, which are a fancy way of saying it's a bug with a bunch of legs. And this bug right here is a millipede. This is the giant uh, African millipede. Interesting thing about these giant African millipedes is that as recently as maybe five or ten years ago, they thought that it was one species. But now they're looking at them and they're thinking that they're actually lots and lots of different species that were all incorrectly grouped together. And they think that these are going to be broken up into probably dozens of different species eventually. But for right now, we just sort of refer to all of them as giant African millipedes. And these are still babies, even though he's pretty big. He's about four or five inches long. He is still tiny compared to what he'll be when he is full size. He could be 12, 13, 14 inches long and as thick around as my thumb. Now, one of the main characteristics for these millipedes is that they have lots of body segments. Each little stripe right here is a body segment. And for millipedes, they have two pairs of legs on each body segment. And you can see them going in a wave there. So if you were to count up every single stripe and multiply by four, you could figure out how many legs they have. And these guys will add more and more legs the older they get. They'll molt like all arthropods, like all of the bugs we're going to be talking about. And as they shed their exoskeleton, they will add new segments and with that, more legs. And so the older these guys get, they can get more legs. Kind of neat. They do have antennae. You can see he's waving them around there on the front of his head, just trying to figure out what, uh, let's see, what uh, is around him. They're usually kind of looking for food. He's just tapping, saying, you got any food, got any lettuce? They really like lettuce and leaves. Now I know Chris is joining me in the chat answering your questions, so if at any point you have questions, feel free to type them out there and Chris will answer them uh, as we go. And then at the end, I'll go through and I'll make sure I answer any questions that were asked as well. Uh, if Chris missed them or if there's anything I can add here in the lab, we'll, uh, we'll definitely answer any questions you have. Now the other group of animals that are closely related to these are the centipedes. Most centipedes are venomous and can bite, and so I usually don't handle them too much. We have a few here that we've shown off in other uh, snack chat talks in the past. Um, but centipedes only have one pair of legs per body segment, and they usually have much fewer segments, so they have fewer legs overall. So some people would call this millipede a bug, and I would not argue with that because I call them bugs or creepy crawlies. We usually refer to bugs as a term of endearment here at the Butterfly House. I always am excited to talk about my bugs and my babies. All right, this is Bob the Millipede, and I'm going to put Bob back here in a second. So we're going to go sort of in order from most legs to fewer legs. Because the next animal we're going to talk about are the group of bugs called arachnids. Now, most people think arachnids, they assume that in this box right here, there's going to be a spider because that's the most commonly known type of bug in the arachnids. But this is not. This is not a spider, but it is an arachnid. Like most arachnids, they have eight legs. Up until recently, people would say, like all arachnids, they have eight legs. But we're going to talk about why that's not quite true in just a second. Let's see if we can get a little bit more light on them. So this is Bob the Vinegaroon. And if we zoom in here, we'll see if we can see him and all of his legs. So on the side here, there's one, two, three, four legs. On each side, that makes eight. And these up front are not legs. Those are part of his mouth that he uses to catch prey. On his back end, it's a little hard to see here, 
but he has a tail. It's not a stinger. They, it is covered in fine hairs, and he uses that to sense what's behind him to make sure nothing's sneaking up on him. Bob here is totally harmless. He looks really scary and medieval, like something that would be in a, in a horror movie or something. But the reality is, is that Bob's a puppy dog. He uses these elongated front legs to reach around in front of him and find what's there because Bob is almost totally blind. Those little dots right at the base of his head, those are his eyes, but he can't really see much. So he's waving his legs around in front of him like a visually impaired person might use a cane to try to find out what's in front of them. So Bob here lives underground in the desert. You can find these in the United States. Bob here came from Arizona. Even though they're a desert species, they like it to be kind of moist and humid, so they bury down underneath rocks where they find some moisture in their burrows so that they don't dry out. Because of this, they usually rely on eating what falls into their burrow accidentally. Maybe a little cricket or something is looking for a place to escape. These guys will also eat worms that uh, will, will show up underground and, and make their way into their burrow. Speaking of worms, do you think a worm is a bug? We actually had a discussion about that here at the Butterfly House the other day. Is a worm a bug? And I think it depends on your own definition of what makes a bug a bug. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But I think it's okay calling a worm a bug, but usually I wouldn't call a worm a bug, but maybe you will, and that's okay. Let's see. Will he wave? Let's see. There you go, uh, Gray. Bob is waving back to you. He says hi back. All right, Bob. Now, Bob is a vinegaroon. They can make a defensive chemical come out of their backside that is almost the exact same chemical as pure vinegar. And it smells really bad. It smells like vinegar and it tastes bad. So if you're a lizard or something, you sneak up on it and you get a, sh a shot of that in your mouth, your eyes, you're going to leave Bob alone because that's going to sting and taste bad. Bob has been handled so much by me, though, that he rarely sprays. He doesn't do much to me. Interesting fun fact about that chemical, it's almost the exact same chemical they use to flavor salt and vinegar potato chips. So what he makes come out of his backside in self-defense, we put on fried potatoes and think it's delicious. Okay, Bob, I'm going to give you your home so you can dig back under there. There we go. But the most common type of arachnid people encounter are spiders. Spiders are very common. Chances are there's a spider within three feet of you, wherever you are right now. They're super common in houses and buildings, and you just usually hardly ever see the ones that are there. So they have eight legs, four on each side. And they have two main body parts. You've got your cephalothorax, which is a fancy way of saying this sort of head part, and then their abdomen. Cephalothorax means sort of fused head and thorax, because insects have a head, thorax, and abdomen. We'll talk more about that in a moment. They used to think that the spider had a fused head and thorax. Scientists now kind of think that was probably wrong, but the name has stuck. So we have the cephalothorax and the abdomen, two main body parts. Now, I've been seeing a lot of posts on the internet lately about spiders that got into people's houses. And unfortunately, so often, people's first instinct is to squish the spider. And most of these spiders are pretty good. They're beneficial. They're keeping things like mosquitoes and other things you wouldn't want in your house at bay. So I want to show you how you can save a spider if it's someplace where you don't want it. This here is a brown recluse spider. These are also very common indoors. If you live in Missouri, chances are you've got one of these in your houses right now. You just may not know it. Hopefully that's showing up. You can see the violin shaped on his cephalothorax on his head. This is a male. You can see he's got two big palps at the very front of his head. They look sort of like uh, drumsticks or maracas at the very front of his, uh, of his face there. And uh, he was out looking for a female, actually found him wandering around outside. You usually find these guys indoors, but I was just outside and he was on the ground, so I scooped him up. And I'm going to show you how you can save one of these instead of squishing it. 
And you can do this to any kind of spider or really any kind of bug. So you may remember this from last week. This is my handy dandy ladybug ID chart. By the way, has anybody seen any ladybugs? If you have, take some pictures of them and put them in the comments. We'd love to see which ladybugs uh, you're finding. But for today, we're gonna use this as our handy dandy spider relocator card. So first thing you need is a spider to be out. And Bob here's got kind of comfy. We'll see if I can get him to leave his cup. Didn't think that he's not gonna wanna leave. Let's see, we'll fish him out here. All right, Bob the spider, it's time for you to get out of your cup. There we go. So, and I knew he was gonna run, so I was kinda ready for that. We'll see if he settles down just a second. We'll take the cup off. There we go. So if you have a spider that's on the loose, the first thing you gotta do is find something like a cup just to put over top of it. I'm gonna move the camera here just a little bit. Let's see here. Bob went to a tough spot to film, of course. There we go. So Bob is under, under the cup and you're gonna take anything. It could be a sheet of paper, a piece of cardstock, a piece of cardboard. You've got your bug in there you want to relocate. I'm just going to crack the edge just a little bit, enough to get the paper underneath the cup. And I'm just very slowly going to work the cup and the paper over top of each other and trapping the spider or other bug in between. I'm doing it slow so I don't catch a leg and accidentally injure him. And I'll show you real quick that just like that, Bob the Brown Recluse Spider is safely underneath the cup. And now just put a little pressure on the top so it doesn't slide off. Slide your hand under the bottom and just like that you can even turn it upside down and he's safe in the cup and now you can take him anywhere you want. Take him outside, take him to a shed, take him out to the woods, any place, any bug like that. You can relocate safely. You don't have to smush them. These guys are good for the environment. They're beneficial. All spiders do a really important job of taking care of small insects and pests. And they're bros, spider bros. You wanna keep them around. So uh, you can just relocate them outside safely that way. That's my PSA for saving bugs for the week. Now, I did mention earlier that most arachnids have eight legs. But something recently happened that kind of threw everything into a bit of, well, well, we'll say a little confusion about what exactly is an arachnid. Does anybody recognize what this is? This is a horseshoe crab. These live in the ocean. I don't have any here to show you, so I'm just using pictures. Horseshoe crabs are really cool. Uh, for the longest time, people thought they were some type of crab. They weren't really sure where they fit because their morphology, their physical characteristics were a little weird and unique and didn't really fit in with other animals the way they kind of thought they should. And then came the taxonomists and the geneticists and they began running molecular analysis on their DNA. If we look right here, this is the uh, underside of a horseshoe crab, and they have one, two, three, four, five legs on each side. Two, three, four, five. That means they have ten legs. Like all arthropods, all the bugs we're talking about, they have bilateral symmetry. Something we did talk about last week with the ladybugs and other insects is that it's a mirror image. If it has uh, five on one side, they're going to have five on the other. So this horseshoe crab has ten legs. But they found through molecular analysis that it's actually an arachnid. Kind of crazy. They have now grouped these in with arachnids. So all other arachnids have eight legs except for the, for, for the uh, horseshoe crabs here that have ten. I think that's kind of cool. And if there's any St. Louis Blues fans out there, which hopefully there's a couple... You know, they say we all bleed blue, and that's true. Hermit crab, or sorry, the horseshoe crab here, I think is the uh, perfect bug that's a fan of the blues because their blood is blue. Horseshoe crabs literally bleed blue. And 
Scientists have found all sorts of amazing uses for their special blue blood. They use them as bioindicators for bacterial contamination and things. Their blood is super sensitive to bacteria. And so they use these in uh, laboratories all around the world to make sure that things like medical equipment and medicines aren't being contaminated by bacteria. Pretty cool. And I like to think uh, in, in their uh, downtime, they root for the blues to uh, win back-to-back Stanley Cups. All right, so why did I have this picture of myself earlier? For those of you uh, tuning in a little late, at the very beginning we started with my pre-quarantine self-portrait here and uh, this here frog. They're not very closely related to each other, you know, a person and a frog. These guys are in different classes of animals. So, for instance, our bugs we've talked about are all arthropoda that is the phylum they all are under the umbrella of uh, arthropods both the frog and humans are under chordata but they branch from there so human and a frog are related to each other the same way a spider and a moth are related to each other so a lot of people struggle to, f- to try to have uh, an idea of how different types of bugs are related to each other. Well, they're not super closely related the same way that a frog and a person or a frog and a fish or a lizard and a bear. Those are all about equally related to each other as something like a centipede and a butterfly. All right, final group of uh, animals we're going to talk about are insects. Final group of bugs, I should say. Hopefully some of you already know the main characteristics of insects. They have three main body parts. You've got the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. This here is a flamboyant flower beetle, also called a jade-headed buffalo beetle. He's been doing beetle yoga ever since I put him in here. His legs are all stretched out. And you see right here, those are his eyes. And his head is sort of tucked under there. So that's his head. This is the thorax. The thorax is where all the legs attach on an insect. And back here is the abdomen. I think he's super pretty. It's very shiny. It is a male because he has this big forked horn. The males will wrestle other males for the right to mate with a female. And so the males get these big horns. This species is from tropical Africa. Now, like all insects, he also has three pairs of legs. You can see one pair uh, or one half of them here. You see one, two, three. And because they are symmetrical, he has three on the side too. So all insects have six legs, three main body segments, and then they have one pair of antennae. It's worth mentioning that the arachnids, the groups I showed you before, none of them have antennae, but insects have antennae. This is a scarab beetle, and scarabs have these really funky branched antennae at the tip that are kind of feathery. Let's see if we can show that off. Yeah, you can kind of see it there but they're really neat. If you ever see a June bug come to your light at night or a Japanese beetle on your plants, look at their antennae and they're usually really neat. And those are both types of scarab beetles you can find here in Missouri. So that's, you know, bugs and insects are often used interchangeably and I see nothing wrong with that. But there's actually one type of insect that is specifically called a bug or a true bug. And if you want to be really technical, technically only those types of insects are actual bugs or true bugs. Let's see. Now, let's see here. Right there, he has very strong claws. They don't hurt or anything, but he has got a good hold of my fingers. 
he just doesn't want to fall off, or if I'm a bird or something, he doesn't want me to pull him off his branch, or in this case, my fingers. So he's got a good hold of me. I'm going to have to gently loosen him so as I don't injure his legs. There we go. Please let go, Bob. Sometimes you get him off one finger, and then he grabs a hold of another finger. Quit being a stinker, Bob. There we go. So there are insects called true bugs. And a lot of you have probably seen these guys. And this one is not with us anymore. It is dead. But that's okay because it is a pest species. This is the brown marmorated stink bug. And I bet you you've probably had these in your house this year. These are an introduced species from Asia. They don't have many natural predators here in Missouri and really in the United States as a whole. And they are an agricultural pest. And they um, love to suck the juices from plants. And they've been spreading like wildfire. And unfortunately, they're popping up in large numbers all around uh, the country. Uh, I find lots of these in my house. They like to come indoors. They're a stink bug. They do smell bad if you, if you disturb them or if you squish them. They have these chemicals in their, in their bodies that taste really bad, that, that animals learn not to eat them or disturb them because they can, they can um, exude drops of those chemicals as well. Now, this is a true bug. And to get technical, a true bug has what's called hemi-elytra, which is sort of a fancy way of saying this um, outer wing covering that sort of looks like a triangle. You can kind of see that there. They have sort of leathery half wings that are their top half of their wings. Most uh, insects have two pairs of wings. The exception of that is flies. Things like fruit flies and house flies only have one pair of wings, but all other insects that have wings have two pairs, including things like butterflies and moths and stink bugs. And they can fly. They can un uh, fold their wings here and then, then fly away. Um, most true bugs have this very distinctive triangle shape on the top of their head. So you can tell that that's a true bug. But we still call things like, uh, you know, cockroaches and things like that bugs. And uh, even though it may not be technically true, we are okay with it because, like I said, we use it as a term of endearment. Inside this cup here, hopefully we can see it. This is a baby brown marmorated stink bug. And we are having, we are finding these on some of our plants here at the butterfly house. These are a pest. Let's see, he's going to come up and say hi. Now, he does not have wings because he is an immature. All insects lack wings until their adult stage. So if you ever see an insect with wings, you know it's an adult and it's done growing. Now, if you see a, a, a stink bug like this, it's a brown marmorated stink bug, it's okay to squish this one bug because this is an invasive species. It is damaging our ecosystem. It's damaging our crops. But there are lots of native stink bugs that are beneficial. Some of them are predators and will actually eat the brown marmorated stink bug. So you want to make sure that you know which stink bug it is before you go on a smushing spree. But unfortunately, the brown marmorated stink bug has become very, very common. All right. Go back in the cup. Real quick, because we have just a couple more minutes here, I want to talk to you about these bugs. You've got a moth at the top. This is a luna moth. And then it's down here is a butterfly. I think this is a lime swallowtail. Uh, so... Some people always ask us how to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth. And I thought I'd just take one minute here and give you a couple things to look for. So first thing you can look for, which is very consistent, is the antennae that you see right here. So the antennae of a butterfly always end in a club or an enlargement. Sometimes it's a little bit more obvious than others, but you see the very tip of it there, how it's bigger? That means it's a butterfly. Whereas a moth's antennae 
are fuzzy, like this guy. This is Luna Moth here. Their antennae are very fuzzy, or they're thin and get thinner at the tip. Those are the two kinds of antennae for a moth. So if they're fuzzy or they look like they're getting thinner and thinner, it's probably a moth, whereas the butterfly has the clubbed antennae or the enlargement at the end. Also, butterflies are active during the day. When it's daylight, most moths, not all, but most are active at night. They're nocturnal. If you are active during the day, your color usually matters a lot more. Things can see you. Light is reflecting off of you. So butterflies are usually more colorful. Moths usually want to dedicate the, their colors to blending in, to camouflage during the day so that birds don't eat them when they're not active. Now, there are some day-flying moths that are very, very flashy and very showy, very pretty. And there are some butterflies that are very drab or, or, or brown or gray that are dedicated to blending in and camouflage. But for the most part, butterflies are more colorful and moths are usually more muted in color. It's tough to show it on a mount like this, but when a butterfly's wings are at rest, they make what I call the sailboat shape. Their wings are together up off of their body. If this was the body of uh, if, if the forceps here were the body of the caterpillar, its wings would be up like this, away from it. Moths, they fold their wings over top of each other and lay them flat against their body more often than not. So if the wings are out away from the body at a 90 degree angle, it's probably a butterfly. If the wings are flat hugging the body, it's more likely to be a moth. Um, there are a few other differences, but really those are some of the easiest things to look for uh, at a glance. Also, moths form cocoons, and butterflies form chrysalids. They don't have that outer coating of silk that the moths have. So... That's about it today for our demos. We do have a few other things that some people, uh, you know, are always asking, is, is it a bug? You know, some people want to know, uh, what about things like uh, snails? Are snails bugs? That's a good question. Are worms bugs? What about pill bugs? I would say a pill bug is a bug for sure. I generally don't think of things like worms or snails or slugs as bugs, but other people do, and that's okay. Um, I usually think of bugs as different types of arthropods, those things with jointed appendages and specialized body parts like the animals we talked about today. But if for you, if you want to call a worm a bug, I'm okay with that. Uh, I think it, it's whatever you want it to be. You also hear phrases like... Uh, superbugs, talking about viruses and bacteria and things like that. Uh, I think that's sort of a different use of the word bug. I think that's a little different than what we're talking about. But if you want to include things like viruses and germs with bugs, hey, I'm not going to stop you. I think it all comes down to what you feel comfortable calling them, and that's okay. So as we show off Bob, the uh, jade-headed beetle here, I'm going to read through the questions and comments. So if anybody has any last-minute questions, feel free to ask them here. Paula, yes, that was a picture of me. I told you. That was, it was before quarantine, right? Yeah, see? That's a selfie I took a, a few weeks back. Uh, you know, things have changed a little bit. Hi, Sally. Thanks for tuning in. I think Sally's been to every single snack chat so far. We love seeing you here. She also used to volunteer here for many years. So shout out to Sally. You're the best. Oh, it looks like my mom and dad are tuned in. Thank you very much. Oh, my mom says I look like my dad. Uh, are horseshoe crabs considered the largest arachnid? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I have to think about that for a second. My guess is probably, at least by weight, um, there are some spiders um, like the Goliath bird eater and the salmon pink bird eater, which we have here. 
that get really large leg spans. They can be as big as a dinner plate that may have a larger leg span than a horseshoe crab, but some horseshoe crabs get pretty big. So they're probably uh, one of not, if not the largest arachnid. That's a good question. Oh, and it looks like Chris gave the same answer in the chat. So I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh, what are bed bugs and ticks? Good question. So bed bugs are actually a type of true bug. And, then, and uh, they are related, not super closely, but uh, they're related to things like the stink bug that we showed. And they do live uh, in people's houses. They like to live in and around bugs. They will bite you and draw blood. The females drink blood and they will bite you um, while you sleep. Ticks are actually a type of arachnid. They have eight legs and they also drink blood. Um, I would consider both of them um, bugs, although one of them is also a true bug. Katie Mack, thanks for tuning in. Love seeing uh, you. Uh, appreciate the support. So Paul asks, how far would we put that brown recluse spider? Now, the truth is I'm going to save that spider because we'll, we will use him in displays here. People like to see what our brown recluse spider looks like up close. Uh, but if we were to relocate him, um, I would think if you move um, anything over like 100 feet from your house, it's very unlikely that it would come back inside. Um, you know, if you take him... Um, if you live across the street from a wooded area or someplace like that, that's probably more than enough um, distance to relocate almost any of these bugs. They won't come back into your house. Darla asks, why is every insect named Bob? Well, my friends will tell you that I am very bad with names, and so calling them all Bob makes it easy for me to remember. Oh, great. He's always asking for a last minute mantis update. Okay, I'll show some of those off real quick before we sign off. Are there any predators that like to eat stink bugs, especially the pesky ones? The brown marmorated stink bug, there's not too many that control them in large number. Uh, I think they're experimenting with parasitoid wasps, but I don't know if they're having much success with that. Those are tiny, tiny wasps that would live in their eggs. Um, and reproduce there. Um, I know things like some praying mantids will eat them. Um, praying mantises don't care too much about how things taste. They're, um, they're, they'll usually eat just about anything, but they don't really focus on them and um, they haven't really been useful in controlling them. All right, so I think that's about the end of it. We did ask, uh, we were asked for a Mantis update. This will serve as a little bit of a sneak peek for what's going to be on display this summer, too, because one of these will be on display when we reopen, whenever that is. This here is an orchid mantis. Little guy. Just starting to get some of his pink coloration. He's very pretty. We have um, surplused a few of our mantids to other institutions as well. It's kind of exciting. We've been able to share the wealth um, with some other insect zoos around the country. So they get some of our babies as well. All right. So with that, thank you very much for tuning in. Next week, we will be going live at the same time, 10.30 a.m. next Thursday where we'll be doing a bug hunt. We will be going, hopefully outside, weather permitting, and looking for bugs, and just sort of seeing what we find together. Uh, until then, everybody out there, please stay safe, take care of yourselves, and if you have any questions watching this uh, after the fact, after we were live, and you have any more questions, post them right down there in the comments, and I'll make sure I tune in during the week and answer them for you. Thanks a lot, everybody, and stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.